All right, welcome to Hoops Tonight here at The Volume. Happy Friday, everybody. Hope all of you guys had an incredible week. We have a very special show for you guys today. My friend Jovan Buha, who covers the Lakers for The Athletic and does an incredible job, has been there on the ground at Lakers training camp, getting us ready for the season. I'm really, really excited to talk all things Lakers and get some up-close and personal perspective. Jovan, how's it going, man? It's good to see you. It's great, man. Uh, it's great to see you. And uh, this feels like the, the first week of school. And uh, you're, you're seeing all your friends again. Uh, everything is going great. Uh, so no complaints from me. Yeah, I uh, I covered uh, Timberwolves Mavs yesterday. And like getting out of that offseason grind to like actually covering real basketball feels good. And I, I have to say, I'm probably as excited for this particular NBA season as I have for any time in, uh, in, in my life. This is this is there's just so much talent. The top of the league, there's so much parity. There's so many different teams that could rise above this group of uh, of incredible talent at the top of the league. I'm excited. But you have been on the ground at Lakers training camp. We are through four days of practice in media day. Um, what is the pulse around the team, obviously, going into their first preseason game tomorrow? Well, the vibes around the Lakers are at an all-time high. Uh, I can say that this is my fourth training camp covering the team. And this is the most positive and optimistic and confident that the group has been since I've been there. Uh, so I think one, that, that that's a great sign for Laker fans. Uh, but two, uh, you know, the, the talk of camp has been how LeBron James has looked like his pre-injury self, which I think if we're mapping out how this team ultimately wins a championship, it's got to be LeBron getting back to being a top 10 player uh, consistently. And, you know, Darvin Ham was comparing him to his third or fourth year self athletically. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I buy the that LeBron's looking like a 22 or 23 year old right now. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, as we saw at the end of last season and with the way that the playoffs went, uh, barring, you know, game four against Denver and, and a few other big performances, like he wasn't himself clearly. And, and there were times that he would be laboring on that foot. Uh, there were times he peer, uh, appeared a little deferential uh, to Austin Reeves or Anthony Davis. Uh, so I, I think if the Lakers can get the pre-injury version of him, which remember in December, or January, uh, when AD went out, he was routinely dropping 30 points a night, uh, had some 40-point games in there as well, and really looked the best he had looked offensively, in my opinion, in a couple of years. So if you can get that version of LeBron with this uh, continuity that they have now, the, the deeper supporting cast, the improved three-point shooting. Uh, I think that's where you can be really dangerous offensively. Uh, the other thing has been Anthony Davis's jump shot. By all accounts, uh, it's looked much better than it has over the past couple of seasons. Uh, and then rookie Jalen hood Shafino has gotten multiple shout-outs, just got a shout-out today from AD uh, for his, his pick-and-roll play, uh, his court vision, his point-of-attack defense. So... Uh, Again, vibes are at an all-time high right now compared to where they've been in the past. And uh, right, you know, right now, all, all the buzz has been about LeBron and AD. You know, it's interesting because we're going to talk about the contenders at the top of the league and where the Lakers stack up later on in the show. Uh, but when I look back at the Denver series, it really came down to three things for me. Their backcourt athleticism, Bruce Brown just kicked their ass because he was bigger, faster, and stronger than all of the guards back there. And then the backup center position was tough. It wasn't as big of a, a problem in the Denver series because Denver's bench center is is kind of a position that's also in flux. But throughout the postseason, it was an issue, especially in the Memphis series uh, uh, when, they, when they were stacked staggering Jaron Jackson in with the bench group so that LeBron was, you know, having to deal with that. Uh, but then the last piece was the shot making piece. Every single one of those games was close. Three of the four games went down to a clutch situation, meaning it was within five points with less than five minutes left. And then that fourth game that didn't go, I think it was game three, that didn't go to a, a clutch situation. The Lakers held a double digit second half lead. And that might've actually been game two. But the point is, is every single one of those games was kind of hanging in the balance going into the later portion. And when push comes to shove, every single playoff game we've ever seen basically grinds down into a rock fight at the end of these games and the whistle gets swallowed and it's super physical and you can't get easy shots. And it really comes down to, can you make tough contested shots over the top? And time and time again, Jamal Murray did it and Nikola Jokic did it and LeBron James couldn't and Anthony Davis couldn't. And so, you know... <clears throat> We can talk about trades and we can talk about hypotheticals and different guys they could bring in that might be able to rectify that. But the easiest solution is LeBron James and Anthony Davis getting back to where they were in 2020 
where they can make those shots. They're never going to make them at as high a rate as that Nuggets squad or even the Suns or a lot of these other teams around the league that have higher level shot makers. But if they can at least take away some of that gap, then their physical advantages can come to the surface. Because even in LeBron's limited state, he was so dominant out of the post in that postseason run. He's still one of the best matchup attacking big forwards at bullying his way to the rim against smaller defenders that we have in the league. And so they have so many advantages elsewhere on the roster. If they can just kind of mitigate that gap, that can make a difference. And the Jalen hood Shafino stuff is super exciting to me because he is that big, strong, athletic guard that can really – like actually hang in the physicality areas of the game. Darvin Ham was talking a lot about him and how big and strong he is for his position. I, I could see that being something that could help mitigate that issue a little bit. Um, go As far as like the motivation level goes, where are you at with this Denver LA trash talk stuff? I think it's so silly because I can't even imagine why anyone would care that the Lakers want revenge. If they didn't, it would be weird. What's your take on the whole Mike Malone, Bruce Brown, trash talk, Lakers feeling motivated situation? Well, I'm with you. I think it is a little silly, uh, but I think it's as close to a modern rivalry as we have right now, probably in the NBA, uh, you know, with, with the, the roster turnover and, and stars going team to team. You don't see the classic rivalries that we had in the, the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s. Uh, but for me, I mean, I, I get why the Lakers feel the way that they do. I, I think Denver uh, and, and look, Denver won. So you, you can talk trash when you win and you can kind of celebrate wh whichever way you want, but uh, you know, with Mike Malone saying he's the Lakers' daddy at, uh, at the, <laughs> the, the you know their <laughs> a celebration and uh, at the parade, and, and then him kind of poking fun at LeBron's retirement and uh, say he was going to retire, and like j there's just been little jabs there, and um, you know it, it's interesting to me because Mike Malone and LeBron used to have a, a great relationship. Uh, back when uh, Malone was an assistant in Cleveland. So, you know, things have, have obviously taken a turn there a bit. Uh, but I, I'm really interested to see how the Lakers come out uh, on opening night. I, I don't want to get too uh, hyperbolic with it, but I, I think it's a chance for them to land a, a haymaker, uh, to send a message to, to start the season. And, you know, for, for them, looking at that opening schedule, they have a very difficult slate to start. I mean, just the first three games alone, at Denver, home against Phoenix, then at Sacramento, you could easily go 0-3 over those three games. You could go 3-0 and as well. Uh, but for them, with the way that they've started the last few seasons a little bit slower, I think it's important to go to Denver, You know, send them a message of, we're not afraid of you. You don't have a psychological advantage over us anymore. Uh, you know, Forget like the sweep was last season. Put that behind us. And then also start the season 1-0 and and just kind of get some momentum and, and carry that over because we've seen them struggle in the preseason the last few years. We, we've seen them struggle to start the year. And I think another loss to Denver, uh, again, it, it's not debilitating by any means, but it would just kind of continue the trend of Denver, I, I think, having an edge over them. Yeah, the psychological element is always interesting. <clears throat> it reminds me of the Clippers in 2020 where it was like they lost an opening night and then they lost on Christmas Day and it kind of felt like – the Clippers had a little bit of a mental advantage, but then the Lakers got them once right before the bubble in rather convincing fashion in the fourth quarter. And then they got them at the start of the bubble. And then it's like, ever, like, like literally th there was never a psychological advantage uh, since then, except for they've just been so limited from a roster standpoint in recent seasons. But you never felt like if the Lakers had to play the Clippers in that postseason run in the bubble, that they would have had any issues because it felt like they'd kind of overcome that. And that psychological advantage can definitely play a role. It plays a role in everything, like how com comfortable the, ro the role play players are how comfortable you know um the team might feel if they're down by 10 in the middle of the third quarter and belief that they could come back like that sort of thing I 100% agree with you I think coming off of last season and their two and ten start it's almost vital for their belief in the locker room to notch two or three key kind of like signature wins just to kind of give them that belief that pushes them forward because this team in particular you know when I look at the, the top of the league and I look at Milwaukee and Boston, and I look at Phoenix and Denver and LA, they're, all of them have different strengths. And the Lakers' specific strength has to be the defensive end. They're never going to beat these, these teams like Denver or Phoenix or Milwaukee from a skill standpoint. They're never going to be able to go shot for shot with Dame or, or, or with Jokic or with KD or any of these guys. They have to be a blue-collar, beat-you-up defensive team. Now, my question would be, I actually was uh, um, talking with my buddy Anthony Irwin about this uh, yesterday, and I find it to be really interesting. You know, 
we know that D'Angelo Russell is the contract that's kind of poised as the guy who could be traded. And to, and to be clear, I'm sure the Lakers will approach the season as though they don't intend to make a trade and see what this group is capable of, and they'll make that call when they get to the deadline. But uh, I think I think D'Angelo Russell in one of the forwards basically functions as whatever your salary filler is if you did decide to make a trade. Now, I, I look at it as like there's two different directions they could go. They could either go all in on that defensive identity and try to find basically a, a, a more dependable starter caliber player at the two or three that's a, a, a perimeter defender, or they can go in on a shot maker, try to find somebody to help LeBron and AD and slow down half-court environments. Which need do you think is more important for the Lakers? And if you were the GM, which direction would you go in terms of actually strengthening out the weaknesses of the roster? I really like that question. Um I mean, ideally both, if I know those types of guys are, are hard to find and uh, potentially out of the financial range that they're looking at with, with D'Lo plus whoever else you want to lump in there. Uh, if I had to choose one you know, between the two, I, I would lean defense. Uh, I do think that this group's perimeter defense, uh, it's interesting because they're running it back with essentially, you know, most of the, the roster that wasn't the number two defense to close out the regular season, but I think going from Dennis Schroeder to Gabe Vincent is a slight downgrade uh, at the point of attack. I think Gabe is better defensively than some people have given him credit for, at least when I see them discussing his role. Uh, but, you know, he, he's not Dennis. Uh, and and then I, I think Vando, I'm really interested to see what Vando's role is this season, whether it's starting, coming off the bench, how many minutes is it? Uh, just because as we saw in the playoffs, teams were really able to scheme him off the floor and I think the the jury's out with him where, uh, you know, when, when you're game planning for the Lakers, you are going to just completely ignore him and, and dare him to make you pay. So, uh, you know, I, I think if I'm looking at it, I, I think they, they probably need a little bit more perimeter defense. If we're talking about how they match up with, say, the Suns, uh, it's a bit concerning. Like, let's just even if you throw Vando out there with, with the projected starting group, like he takes probably KD, uh, I would assume. And then we we're putting Austin on on book and then D'Lo on, on Beal or, you know, who's LeBron guard. Like, I just think there's a lot of questions there defensively for the Lakers with how they match up with teams like Phoenix and the Clippers and the Celtics uh, teams with multiple scoring wings. And so I, I would be looking to plug that hole, but I, I still think the shooting is a big you know issue potentially as well, where on paper it is better, but they were a bottom five, three point shooting team last year. So even if you go from like 25th to 20th, that still might not be good enough. Yeah, I think you got to nudge up closer to 15, 12, you know, try to crack the, the top 10 if you can, uh, because historically that's kind of what we see with, with teams that win the championship. So uh, between, I think they need to address both, honestly, but if I had to pick one, I would lean defense. Yeah. I, I've been thinking about this nonstop all summer because, you know, the, the way I look at the Laker off season was, a lot of people are missing the boat. It, it, yeah, they didn't get demonstrably better in terms of their ceiling, but they did get deeper at a bunch of key positions, which will help them in the dregs of the regular season, particularly with LeBron and Anthony Davis inevitably missing 40 to 50 games between the two of them, right? So I, I like the offseason from that perspective, but that top end improvement did not take place in this particular offseason, unless there's some gigantic leap from a player like Rui or a player like, uh, you know, a player like Christian Wood, for instance, or something along those lines. So, like, I don't really see that move there. And so in when I look at the the guys at the top of the league, you almost have to look at it from the standpoint of you can't try to play them at their game when you're not as good at it. So like, I don't like the idea of targeting a shot maker unless it's somebody the caliber of Kyrie Irving, which is highly unlikely, right? So like, if it's someone like Kyrie, then you look at it like, yeah, we can go shot making toe for toe, with, toe to toe with some of the best teams in the league. But if it's anybody kind of below that tier, if you want to get in a shot making contest with the best teams in the league, you're just going to lose. Yeah. For a limited time, Verizon customers can get Netflix and NFL Plus for just $25 a month with Plus Play. That's $120 of annual savings. Plus Play is a platform where Verizon customers can shop, manage, and save on subscriptions you already love, like Netflix and NFL Plus. With NFL Plus Premium, you get access to live games on mobile, NFL Red Zone, NFL Network, and more. Just go to verizon.com forward slash plus play to bundle and save on Netflix and NFL plus today for a limited time only. 
The NFL season is going strong, and DraftKings Sportsbook is hooking new customers up with an offer that's even stronger. Bet five bucks on any game this week to score $200 instantly in bonus bets. And DraftKings isn't stopping there. All customers can take advantage of a sweeter offer every game day this October. There are eight games this weekend that have point spreads that are either three or smaller than three. Lots of good betting opportunities for you guys to take advantage of. Get in on the game day greatness. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code HOOPS. New customers can score $200 instantly in bonus bets when you bet five on the NFL. That's code HOOPS, H-O-O-P-S, only on the DraftKings Sportsbook app, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. The crown is yours. So, like, what I like about going in on a perimeter defender that's more functionally fitting with the starters is, like, a high-caliber role player at the two or three is in that predicament, you can lean in on the thing that you're best at, which is the defensive end of the floor. And there's no chance if you get a high-level, above-average perimeter defender that can function offensively, if you get a player like that, Phoenix, Denver, Boston, Milwaukee, they're not going to be able to hang with you defensively, not with uh, with Anthony Davis as the best defensive player in the world on the front line and what you have in Jared Vanderbilt and, and LeBron's, you know, when LeBron's engaged defensively, the type of high IQ help defender that he can be. Now, obviously, that's a trade deadline issue. So looking at like the meat and potatoes of the season, you know, you and I had a conversation earlier this week and you made a point that I think was really interesting and I, and I want you to kind of expound upon it a little bit. You had mentioned the idea of kind of pairing D'Angelo Russell with Jared Vanderbilt and Rui Hachimura with Gabe Vincent. And I think it's really smart because Vanderbilt is this, you know, kind of second tier, maybe top tier perimeter defender. And then Rui Hachimura can struggle with that. But Gabe Vincent's clearly a much better point of attack defender than D'Angelo Russell. So what can you like, do you, do you think those pairings are going to have to stay together? Or do you think that Darvin Ham's going to go with somebody different in that three spot? Like after this four week, uh, four days of practice, is there any Intel on who's in the lead to get that three spot with the perimeter defense issue? Yeah. I mean, it, it's been the talk of camp. Like that, that's the one question the Lakers have right now is who is the fifth starter and, and specifically who is the starting small forward. Uh, unless they throw a wild card in. And I know Jackson Hayes did some scrimmaging with AD the first couple of days as a 5-4 uh, tandem, and, and AD spoke about that today at practice. Uh, but for, from my understanding, it's been a competition between Rui, uh, Vando, and Torian Prince. Uh, Torian Prince being a, a dark horse just because of his three-point shooting. Uh, and I would say around average defensively, uh, not going to kill you on that end. Uh, but not necessarily a plus the way that a Vando is or a Rui can be, uh, you know, potentially in, in bigger matchups as we saw him uh, defending Jokic in the playoffs. Uh, but I, I think, uh, you know, those tandems make the most sense. Uh, so with D'Lo starting, uh, it feels like Vando's getting the edge a, a bit in, in camp so far. Uh, I know that that first day, which is theoretically, I mean, the first day of camp, like that's the first thing you want to see. Vando was the primary guy with the starting group. Uh, so I, I want to give him the slight edge right now, but everything I've been hearing entering camp was that Rui was the favorite. Uh, so it feels like there's some mixed messaging going on right now. Uh, maybe the Lakers are, are trying to just play it coy and, and they don't want us to know yet. Uh, but everything I've been hearing <laughs> for prior, whatever reason, <laughs> for whatever reason, uh, it, it's the, I mean, it's the preseason, like, uh, and people are going to see it in Denver on opening night. I, I don't think it really dramatically shifts things, but, to, to your point, um, I think they should try and keep those pairings together. And, and that's where I, I see it potentially as you start D'Lo and Vando, but you end up closing with Gabe and Rui, similar to the playoffs, where uh, for those first couple of series, it was a lot of D'Lo starting uh, alongside Vando. And then when it came to crunch time, it was Dennis and Rui closing games. And that ended up being the Lakers' best lineup was the, their big three with Dennis and Rui, I could see it being similar with, with Rui and Gabe. Uh, so th that's how I kind of see that breaking down. Uh, personally, I would start Rui. Uh, I think that each of the three small forward options has clear strengths, but they also have clear weaknesses. And to me, Rui is the best blend between offense and defense. And uh, I know he's not the perimeter defender that Vando is, but I, I just think starting Vando comes with so much risk offensively of uh, you know, we saw him working on his corner threes today after practice uh, was, I would say, shot, shooting in the 30 percent based on what I saw. Uh, I didn't see all of them, but uh, was not shooting great, I would say. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's just a concern of 
can this guy be our, our full-time starter? Like I, I look at it as if you start Vando in the regular season, that is a temporary measure. When come playoff time, he's probably gonna have to move to the bench and be more of like a 12 to 15 minute a night guy. So I don't see the point in having a different starting lineup in the regular season versus the playoffs. I know you have to make adjustments, but for me, Rui is the best of those three players. He's getting paid the most of those three players. And I think he offers you the best blend of offense and defense. Has there been any buzz surrounding Tory and Prince? Because I, I look at him as, you know, when you look at those three forwards, Rui functionally on offense um, kind of can play the three because he can shoot well and he can attack closeouts. And, and, but he can also kind of mis- mismatch attack a little bit in the post. But defensively, he's clearly a four. Like he's not a great screen navigator. He's more of a guy that can switch and guard bigger players. And then Vanderbilt defends like a three, but offensively is like a four. But Torian, to me, is like that best mix of like perimeter defense at the wing and perimeter offense at the wing. Does he have any chance to crack into this conversation or is he kind of like clearly the third guy in that tier? I think he has a chance. I I would put him third right now. I I think it's going to be Rui or Vando ultimately starting. But uh, Torian got a a shot uh, on day two as the primary guy with the starting group, I've been told. Uh, So he's been in the mix. And again, he's by far the best shooter, Uh, you know, almost a career 40% three point shooter. Rui, we'll see if he can translate his playoff success into the regular season. But he was a guy who shot 29% with the Lakers uh, after the trade deadline, then that bumped up to uh, just over 48% in the postseason. So uh, Torian offers you know clear value as a shooter. I just don't know if, like, I don't know if there's a big gap between say trying to make him your primary wing defender and trying to make Rui your primary wing defender. Like Rui he said he hasn't slimmed down. He looks slimmer. He looks more athletic. Um, I, we've seen some of those scrimmaging clips that the, the Lakers social team has posted. He's taking guys off the dribble and dunking and uh, attacking the rim with force. So uh, I, I think Rui again is the best of the three. Uh, and, and, you know, like I, I would say I've talked to some people at the team that are like, why don't you just go matchup based? And, and why don't we have a revolving starting lineup where some games, you know, if you, if you need the, the perimeter defense for a certain matchup, go Vando. If you need, you know, uh, like I think against Denver, Rui makes more sense. Like for, for opening night, you put Rui on Jokic and then you have AD as you know, roaming and and helping on the back line. Uh, whereas Vando, I think it's going to be a similar thing where, uh, they just completely ignore him and he kind of isn't, doesn't really have a clear guide to defend. Like, I I don't think Murray is is a great matchup for him. So, um, we'll see, uh, I, you know, again, all the Intel I'd gotten before camp was Rui, Seems like since camp has started, they've been leaning a little bit more towards Vando, but we're not really going to know until the end of preseason. That's what Darvin said of, of when we'll actually see the full rotation will probably be either the second to last preseason game or the final one. Well, Rui looks great. And like, like I think it was the, the spin move dunk, I think was against Maxwell Lewis, where he kind of like bumped him off yeah. and then spun and then went up off one leg. Uh, he made Max look really small on that play, <laughs> which which is another one of those things that makes me realize like, okay, like Maxwell Lewis is what, 6'7", and probably 220, 215. Like, and he just made him literally look like a child next to him. Like, that's how big and strong Rui can be. I, I, I think Rui's clearly the best player to put in that spot. It's more just, it, it, it causes you to have some issues in terms of your defensive configuration based on matchups like I think you might have to consider doing more switching because of LeBron AD and Rui and their ability to kind of guard multiple positions on that back line and honestly like D'Angelo Russell's pretty big and strong too and like I, I that, like maybe you don't trust him navigating screens super well but maybe he can slide his feet on defense and force someone to shoot over the top you know or something along those lines I but again they're gonna have to experiment and your idea about the matchup specific starting lineup is perfectly fine I think the only real downside there is there is something to be said about you know the chemistry and continuity that can be gained by giving a lineup a specific lineup a ton of repetition but the reality is is over the course of the season one of those guys will separate themselves and it will just make more sense to have them start on uh, any specific game um how much do you view ad's jump shot as like a swing factor in this particular season i think it's arguably the biggest swing factor of this season, uh, aside from health, which is a big swing factor with this group, especially with LeBron and AD. Uh, but to me, I mean, as you were saying earlier, uh, AD shot making to me, what was arguably the, the key of that bubble run, like you, you just couldn't guard the guy. Like what, when he, what, when you have to guard him out to 18, 20, 24 feet, uh, that just, un- that unlocks his dribble drive game, uh, his face up game. Like th- there's just so many elements that 
Uh, it improves the spacing, and that to me is going to be the key. I, I was speaking with someone from the team uh, earlier this week, of, and they kind of brought up, like, you know, I, I know you're skeptical of, of the two big lineups, and, and we were kind of talking through it, and I was like, it, to me, it's going to come down to AD shooting. And, and eight, like, you know, yes, Christian Wood obviously is a, is a, an above average three point shooter, and I think he's going to provide some nice pick and pop. Uh, options and, and uh, you know, catch and shoot thread and, and all that stuff. But it uh, really has to be, especially when he's playing with Jackson Hayes, it has to be AD to some extent spacing the floor and keeping defenses on it. So uh, for me, what when we, because really going back to the playoff run, like as you said, I think that the Lakers shot making and crunch time was an issue really throughout the playoffs. And, and you know, they did win several close games, but uh, to, to me, it was just like, when the Lakers would lose last season, a lot of it came down to their crunch time offense just stalling, they're dribbling out the clock, uh, and then they're going to run some type of ISO for LeBron or AD, and then you know they're, they'll occasionally make it, but a lot of the times they're going to miss. And uh, that would be kind of the, the blueprint for how the Lakers' offense would crater in crunch time. So for me, if AD can get back to, it doesn't even have to be 33% on three and a half threes a game, but if he can get to... I mean, 32, 33%, maybe fewer attempts uh, and, you know, bump up his mid-range accuracy, bump up his mid-range attempts. Like that is something that I think is a vital uh, development for their offense. If not, then I feel like he just kind of has to play the five. Like I, I think if AD is not spacing the floor, you have another guy in Jackson Hayes, probably not spacing the floor. And then Christian Wood, I don't think just wants to be a, a spot up shooter all the time. Like I just don't see how it works. So to me, AD shot is arguably the key to the playoff offense and then also the key to making some of these two big lineups work. I a hundred percent agree with you. I think it is literally the most important thing this season. And I think of it on, on three specific levels. One, just over the course of the game, getting easier points every once in a while. Like if AD can just pick and pop and, and take four 19 footers, you know, off the catch in the short roll and he makes, you know, one or two of them, that's an extra two to four points a game there that he can get just kind of bolstering his offense. Then like specific coverages can become a problem too. So like 80s floater is enough of a perimeter shot in normal pick and roll coverages. Like against a drop coverage, if if LeBron can get downhill or D'Lo can get downhill and hit AD around 10 feet and he can take that little pop shot, it's fine. But what ends up happening is they do end up switching more towards the later portions of games. And it does turn into a LeBron ISO from the perimeter, or maybe an Austin Reeves ISO from the perimeter. And on those possessions, when AD can't function as a spacing threat off the ball, it becomes an issue, especially when Jared Vanderbilt's out there. It's funny, we put a lot of it on Jared Vanderbilt, but most lineups in the NBA have a non-shooter out there. It's a it's a common thing that you'll see around the NBA. You've got a like the Nuggets basically won a championship like that with Aaron Gordon out there last year. The Warriors the year before with Draymond Green and Kevon Looney. It's a typical problem. It's when you cross like that threshold to where there's nowhere near enough shooting in the lineup in total. When LeBron and AD are broke and you're trying to run Jared Vanderbilt out there, yeah, it can be a problem. 100%. And so like you buy yourself so much more margin for error in those specific situations when the actual stars of the team can make a damn jump shot. And then lastly, it's rescue possessions. Like you call it crunch time. I a hundred percent agree, but like, it's not just crunch time. It's also the th three or four possessions during the game when you have four seconds on the shot clock and someone has to jack a shot up. But like, it makes a big difference when you can occasionally make one of those. It's funny because like the LeBron crunch time offense thing has kind of been the same forever. It's like, let's pretend there's five clutch possessions at the end of the game. LeBron will take like four step back threes and he'll make like one of them, you know? And then like, he'll have that one possession where he physically bullies his way to the rim and gets a bucket. That's five points in five possessions. That's fine when the Lakers are defending. The problem is, is last year's LeBron missed all four of those threes. Like every single game, he couldn't make a damn three. And so like they actually cratered down below kind of like the minimum allowable amount of jump shooting in the lineup. And so it, it is on both of them. Well, now, but the thing add, with LeBron add Russ, is Le add Russ into it too. And <laughs> Oh God. Yeah. Like literally. So like it was, it was, it was completely untenable. Right. So like it, it, it's one of those things where honestly LeBron gets guarded like a jump shooter, even when he can't shoot. So it, it's, I'm less worried about him and he's just so good at finding ways to be good and impactful offensively, even when he's not making shots, but with Anthony Davis in particular, especially with how much, we uh, like we see guys like Austin Reeves run the offense or D'Angelo Russell run the offense or LeBron run the offense in those predicaments. He needs to be able to make a shot. I, I think it's I think it's vitally important 
to the success of this team, especially when we get into slow down playoff environments. Again, like they have this defensive punch and that defensive punch can put them over the top, but not if they get their ass kicked in every other area of the game. It's, it's vitally, it's vitally important. Um, where do you see, where do you see the, uh, uh, the Lakers stacking up right now among, I, I look at it like, I think there's six teams at the top of the league. I'd say it's the Warriors, the Lakers, the the Suns, and the Nuggets, and then the Bucks and the Celtics. And I think the Warriors are clearly at the bottom of that tier. And the, really, the only reason I have them on that tier is out of respect for the fact that they have the same five guys in the starting lineup that won the title, literally like you know 16 months ago or whatever. So like it's a respect nod to them, but they'd be underdogs against every single one of the teams above them in a playoff series. Where do you put the Lakers stacked up with those other five teams? I have them fifth uh, and, and third in the West, uh, fifth overall behind Denver, Phoenix, Milwaukee, and Boston. Uh, I I would say that the Dame and Drew uh, additions resp- uh, for for uh, Milwaukee and Boston respectively have also altered my perception of things a little bit where uh, I think you could have made a case the Lakers were above maybe one or, or both. And now to me, they're clearly <coughs> behind both. Uh, but I know we have a, a disagreement on Phoenix and, and Phoenix versus LA. But for me, I, I just look at, I, I think those four teams, uh, I trust their playoff offenses a little bit more than the Lakers. Uh, I mean, Denver, of course, reigning champs. We just saw the, the, the run that they went on. Phoenix, I, I think sometimes we overthink the fit of, of star trios. And to me, all three guys can play on and off the ball. All three guys are plus shooters. I think they're going to have an insane offensive rating when those three play together. And you have multiple types of guys that you can plug in there. You can go big, you can go small. Uh, they don't have a traditional point guard, but I, I'm i fine with that if I have Kevin Durant and Devin Booker running my offense personally. Uh, and then uh, looking at Milwaukee, like I mean, Giannis, Dame pick and roll is going to be maybe the best pick and roll in the league. And then you have uh, Boston where – I think Chris Apps Porzingis gives them an interior element that they haven't had. Uh, he just led the league in, in terms of post up uh, points per possession. Uh, then I think Drew Holiday being a third or fourth option uh, is much more appropriate slotting for his skill set and what you want from him at this stage of his career. So I just look at, you know, I, I think Boston is, uh, you know, that top six to me is probably the best top six in the NBA. Denver's coming off a championship. Phoenix to me has, has the best trio in the NBA in my opinion and then Milwaukee Damon and Giannis two top 11 12 guys like I don't know it's it's close like I think you can make the case for the Lakers I also think the Lakers are gonna make a move at the trade deadline I think they are one move away from the final roster so once that move happens uh, I could easily see them jumping up to fourth third maybe even second on this list yeah, I, we're we're in a similar wavelength. I, I'd put the Lakers over the Suns just because I'm really concerned about the Suns and their commitment to the dirty work and the specific elements they're going to have to thrive in. Um, I think there's going to be a little bit of an uh, of an example of diminishing returns with the Suns. Like I love Bradley Beal, and I'm I'm with you in terms of in a vacuum that trio is just so insanely talented. But the reality is, is that you know when when you put the three of them together, one of them almost always is going to be out of rhythm or primarily off the ball. And there's usually that's a type of player that thrives in catch and shoot situations and can attack closeouts, but is a guy who devotes his energy and effort to the little things as a cutter or on the defensive end. And I just, I'm not sure that there's a guy on the Suns roster that's willing to embrace that could completely change my mind about that when I see them start playing. So we'll see when when we get to that point, as far as the guys above them, I don't think they have a case over anybody. Um, like, like, like they could beat Denver. I don't think they can't beat Denver. I just think they have to play like almost a perfect series and judging on what we saw last year kind of feels like a long shot, but I agree with you. I think that, I think that, that the front office has done, has done a really nice job of positioning themselves to make the one big trade that could uh, potentially push them over the top. All right. I have one last question before we get out of here. Who is the breakout player on this year's team? So Obviously, if we go back to 2021, we have, you know, Alex Caruso coming off of starting in the NBA Finals. He shoots 40% from three. Kyle Kuzma kind of becomes this really gifted help defender, shoots a, his best percentage from three as a Laker, and kind of it gets the, the recognition that gets him the long-term deal in the future. 
Obviously, Malik Monk in 2022 was a, a veteran minimum guy who popped in a big way. Austin Reeves last year obviously becomes way better than anybody really expected him to become. Who's that guy in 2024? Who's the guy that the scouting department found that that no one values enough and that's going to blow everybody away when we start playing basketball? Max Christie. Uh, give me all the Max Christie stock. Uh, Jackson Hayes was at, I mean, it's kind of been the, the common question we, we've at this point spoken with every player on the team this week. And, uh, the, the, the one common question is always who stood out in scrimmaging, like who, who's impressed you, who surprised you. And Jackson Hayes immediately went to Max Christie, like Max Christie is a dog. Uh, Jackson Hayes was there in summer league. So he saw the Max Christie breakout there, but he's like seeing it up close and, and in person with. Uh, with, with the scrimmaging and, and just the way that, uh, that there was the clip of Max driving and, and finishing at the rim with an and one. Like, I think he just said today, we, we spoke with him, he's put on about 15, 16 pounds of muscle since being drafted by the Lakers. And you, you see it like he, he's just he's filled out a bit. Uh, and I think he's going to play that kind of backup two three role. And, um, you know, I, I look at it as like, I would love to see an Austin Max backcourt and uh, you know, put in, you can put in Torian Prince there, you can put in Rui, you can put in Bando, whoever uh, at the three in, with, with LeBron and AD, but just like those two guys together, I, I think complement each other with, with high basketball IQ, uh, you know, Max can potentially be that perimeter defender. I, I thought last year he was ahead of the curve in terms of rookie defense. And he, I mean, we're talking about like the Lakers needing perimeter defense. Like it could end up being Max Christie. He, I would not be surprised if aside from Vando, he ends up being the best perimeter defender on this roster. Uh, so looking at that backup role of like, can he play 15 to 20 minutes a night, potentially bump that up to, to 20 to 25 deeper in the season. But I, I think the the ceiling for Max is like, again, kind of forcing, maybe not forcing his way to the starting conversation. Cause I think with, with Gabe and, and D'Lo there, it's going to be tough to leapfrog both of those guys, but he could potentially be a closing lock where the Lakers just go bigger on, on the perimeter and say, uh, you know, try and score against Austin, Max, and, and Vando or Austin, Max, and Rui, and, and we're just going to switch everything. Uh, we're going to, you know, play a bunch of guys 6'5 and above and, and you know, use that to our advantage. So I look at Max as already he has the 3 and D skill set. He showed that last year. But the on-ball shot creation, uh, he went to Austin Reeves University for foul drawing. Uh, and, and <laughs> like th those are things that he didn't necessarily have in his bag last year or wasn't comfortable with at least. And if, if he's confident and comfortable similar to Austin, I, I kind of look at it as a similar thing where like last year there were times Max would pass open an open shot and the coaching staff would get on him and be like, you got to take that. Like, even if someone else is open, even if you think there's a better look, like you need to take that corner three on the swing pass, like, or, or you need to, you know, pump fake drive, make a move do something, but play with aggression, play with assertiveness. And I think you started to see a little bit more of that last year, but ultimately he got phased out of the rotation this year. To me, he's looking like the eighth or ninth man. And if he can get real minutes and, and play with confidence, I think he, he has a lot of upside within this rotation. Yeah, I really like the potential for Max because of his ability to function essentially as a two. And I, th I think a lot of people overthink this stuff from the standpoint of, you know, what they need to do offensively for the position. Like the 2020 Lakers, a lot of times would start KCP or Danny Green at the one. Like it would be KCP and Danny Green with LeBron AD and JaVale McGee. And it was because, you know, from the same point of what the the uh, the offense was, LeBron functionally was the point guard. So they didn't need a point guard to be a point guard. They needed a point guard to guard point guards. And, and that's the thing is like there's a there's an opportunity on this team in the in the space of perimeter defense. And like – Max Christie could functionally operate as a two and allow you to keep Rui as the three because of his ability to slide his feet, navigate screens and back pressure. He's got that unique combination of quickness and tenacity and, and give a shit for lack of a better term, but also has the length to bother players like in, in these drop coverages, you have to have the ability to pressure from behind. You have to have the ability to, to like when you're getting over the top of the screen, make the offensive player worried about pulling up because of your ability to create problems with back pressure. Like Dennis Schroeder is good of a point of attack, a point of attack defender as he is just, just, Jamal Murray didn't even see him when he was rising up in these jump shots. He's too small. And so, like, I, I, I think he's a, a great example of a player 
that could benefit from a roster need and find an opportunity that otherwise you would never expect a player of his age to find. Um, Jovan, this was awesome, man. Um, why don't you take a couple minutes really quick just to tell us about uh, what you've been working on lately and how we can um, follow the team by following you? Yeah, well, uh, I've uh, every, all my works at The Athletic, uh, you can read. I've been writing these notebooks on, on kind of different topics from camp uh, on a daily basis. Uh, bigger picture, I'm working on a Lakers Nuggets story uh, about the playoff series and the Lakers feelings and, and what they've learned from that. I also have a Frank Vogel story that I'm working on that I think Laker fans will be interested in. Uh, and I'm documenting everything on social media, uh, whether it's Twitter, Instagram, YouTube shorts, uh, TikTok has kind of been more my bread and butter recently. Uh, but trying to take fans behind the scenes with uh, what it's like to be a reporter, what it's like to cover the team, uh, just behind the scenes stuff. Uh, so you can follow all of that uh, at Jovan Buha, uh, J-O-V-A-N-B-U-H-A. Yeah, Jovan does incredible work. Uh, I just was reading his 10 biggest storylines piece yesterday. That was awesome. Um, the social media stuff he's doing, he's giving you guys a lot of access. I highly recommend you guys follow him on all platforms. Jovan, again, thanks for taking the time for us today. We sincerely appreciate it, and we will see you next time. Yes, sir. Thank you, Jason.